So it's a huge, huge honour um, for us here this evening uh, in this wonderful venue, Stationers Hall, uh, to welcome Olga Rudenko, who is the founder and also editor-in-chief of the Kyiv Independent. Um, Olga grew up in Dnipro, um, a region of Ukraine, which probably just over about a year ago, I doubt many of us in this room had even heard of. Um, and, but now it's become a name like Kharkiv and Mariupol and Curzon, etched on the minds of us here in the UK because of the illegal and brutal war of Putin's Russia on, on its neighbour. But these towns um, and cities and regions and rivers of Ukraine would have remained unknown to us and they would have endured atrocities unknown by us had it not been for the brave and selfless reporting of those journalists both from Ukraine and around the world who have risked their lives to tell the truth of this ongoing war. And few have told that story with more power, responsibility and determination than Olga's team at the Kyiv Independent. Her team has reported on the unfolding Russian aggression, both to those on the front line and serving in that battle, and also to those in their own homes in Ukraine, but also they've offered trusted quality news about the conflict to those of us on the other side of the world, with a Twitter following which is now I think in excess of 2.1 million people. Working her way up from a local newspaper, Olga became a writer and then a deputy editor at the Kyiv Post. Um, but when many of her fellow journalists were sacked by the title's owner because they were refusing to write pieces uh, that were cr that less critical about the government, she and a group of her colleagues decided to leave and then they went about setting up their own organisation, the Kyiv uh, Independent, for which Olga was unanimously voted editor-in-chief. Yet, who could have known at that point that within a matter of months, her new job would, entitle, would involve reporting on Ukraine's very battle for survival? I mean, it's not easy being a new editor at the best of times, but doing that in the middle of a war with intermittent power, uh, huge financial concerns and enormous personal safety worries, both for oneself and one's team, as well as coming under missile bombardments, it's, it's unimaginable, I think, to us. Yet, as Olga said in Time magazine last year, when she was named one of its next generation leaders, it felt like we were defending the essence of journalism. And as her nation continues to battle a tyrant whose success is entirely built on the suppression of a free press, that really could not be more true. This evening's speech, as you'll know, is in honour of the legendary editorial director of the Mirror, Hugh Cudlip. And I feel certain he'll be absolutely delighted that Olga is here tonight and we're able to reach out a hand of friendship and solidarity to her and to her journalists. We are in awe of their bravery and resilience, and we're inspired by their commitment to report the truth and to confront untruth. On Monday, September the 4th, 1939, that was the day after uh, Neville Chamberlain made his famous radio broadcast in which he told the country, this country, that we were at war with Nazi Germany. The Mirror carried this front page message, which I'll just very quickly read to you out of my sellotaped together copy of Publishing Be Damned. For months, even years past, we have tried to warn the public concerning the aims, the threats, the secret intentions of Adolf Hitler. We've been accused of provoking those warlike thoughts that we have endeavoured to defeat by urging that readiness which alone can save us now. But we now forget these dissensions. Today and henceforward, until the end, endure. For Olga and her colleagues, her family, her friends and her fellow citizens, the time to endure remains. And for that, we send them, as fellow journalists, our support, our admiration and our love. Olga, over to you. Thank you for such a warm welcome. I just said it's a wonderful summary of everything I was going to talk about. It's an incredible honor to be here and to have this opportunity to talk to you. I realized that this lecture has been given in the past by native English speakers. And today is going to be different. But I'll do my best. I also know that this lecture has been presented in the past by editors from the BBC, the Financial Times, and other legacy newspapers that some of them are 100 years old. The Kiev Independent, which I'm the editor-in-chief of, is just one and a half years old. 
we publish only in English and we are the world's eyes in Ukraine and Ukraine's voice in the world. And today I would like to talk to you about the choices we make as journalists in challenging times and how these choices shape who we are. The choice number one that I wanted to tell you about is how the Kiev Independent came to be. The Kiev Independent was born out of a crisis and it wasn't the Russian invasion. Let me take you back a year and a half. It's 2021. Ukrainian media landscape is very different from what you know here. It's pretty diverse and not all of it is free. There is a handful of free independent newsrooms that are usually funded by grants from Western donors, but the market is largely dominated by the media owned by Ukrainian oligarchs. The television is theirs. The television is completely theirs. And amid all this, there's one very unusual newsroom working in the heart of Kyiv. It's a weekly newspaper. It's published in English and it's called the Kyiv Post. It's independent. It's very critical of the government and it sort of gets away with it, but barely. One prosecutor general is especially unhappy with the coverage of her work. It's a wonderful team of very motivated journalists and I'm their deputy chief editor. That story ends in November 2021. After being dissatisfied with the critical coverage of the government, the owner of the Kyiv Post decided to take the newsroom under his direct control and to make us soften our coverage. But it wasn't journalism as we know it. And the newsroom refused to accept it. In response, the owner did what Ukrainian media owners do. He fired the entire team and he planned to reboot the Kyiv Post with a different team of journalists and turn it into essentially a PR newspaper publishing puff pieces about the government, winning him friends and influence and not getting him into any trouble. That's what he did. And what about us? The team of 30 journalists who were just fired. We all got job offers from other media on the first day. We could have taken them and moved on with our lives. But walking away like that just didn't feel right. It felt like accepting defeat. Think about it. We are this team of very young journalists. And by saying very young, I mean I'm 34 and I'm one of the oldest ones. We grew up in this quasi free media environment where the world around us and the adults around us have been telling us that this is how things are done. That rich owners say what gets published in the media and what doesn't. That the government gives orders to those owners and the journalists don't have a say in it and the journalists are disposable. When we were studying the Kyiv Independent, one experienced journalist, one experienced former Ukrainian journalist, um, a very high profile one, told me in private, just make peace with the owner and go back to the Kyiv Post. Were you just born yesterday? He asked me. This is how things are done. You just make compromises. Well, fortunately, we were young and angry enough to refuse to accept that. We didn't want compromises. We just wanted to do what we believed in. And that means running an independent newsroom and publishing what we believe is right, what we believe needs to be published, and making mistakes and taking responsibility for them, but doing it as a transparent newsroom that doesn't take orders from the government or the oligarch owner who, own, who pays the bills. 
we also had a very strong feeling that if we just walk away, then we let the bad guys win. Then we let the old system prevail. And we didn't want to let them win. We wanted to show them. So we did the only thing that felt right. We started our own publication. We named it the Kiev Independent. Picking the name was the hardest part. But it was a fitting name for something created as the result of a fight for editorial independence. And soon, that name would become even more meaningful to us as our own country started fighting to preserve its independence. That was the first choice that shaped us. We chose to take up the fight. The choice number two presented itself very fast. We launched the Kiev Independent in a matter of days. Our first daily newsletter came out just one week after we were fired. Our first podcast came out days after that. Our website went live in three weeks. We moved fast, but we had no money, no office, nothing. And then a phone call came. One of the richest people in Ukraine, an actual oligarch, made a very generous offer. He would cover all our expenses. His representative also pledged that we would be free to write anything we wanted, and the oligarch would just be there to pay the bills. That offer was very generous and it would have solved all our problems. As you can guess, we didn't take it. We didn't leave our old newsroom in a storm just to go from one mini oligarch to a full-size one. Instead, we decided that we would do everything we can to become self-sufficient financially. We launched a crowdfunding campaign and we started a membership system. Instead of going with one rich patron, we asked the readers of the Kiev Independent to be our patrons. And as of now, instead of one oligarch, we have almost 10,000 patrons who support us monthly and 20,000 people who have supported us with one-time donations. In our first year, they have already given us more than that all Greg generously offered. That was the second choice that shaped us. We chose to not take the easy road and not to risk losing our independence right after winning it. And I'm not gonna say who the all Greg was, but he did make headlines in the past for owning property in this city. The third choice the third choice that shaped us as the Kiev Independent came three months later. And that one had a very clear and a very memorable timestamp. It came on the early morning of February 24th, 2022. That night I got back home from the office at 3 a.m. At about 4 a.m., the Russian state television started broadcasting a speech by Vladimir Putin. At about 4.50, when he was done speaking, I heard an explosion. Then I heard another one. They were coming from above, and that's how I realized that my city, Kyiv, was under an air attack. Interestingly, one of the first things I thought about in that moment uh, was the boots of London. That's because that was the first reference from history books in my head for what it's like to be in a city that is under an attack from the air. And I didn't know much about air raids. I didn't know how deadly they were. I didn't know how targeted they could be. And I had just listened to a tyrant talking for an hour about how he wants to destroy my nation. So I put the two things together and I concluded that this is it. I'm dying today. At this same time, everyone else on the team of the Kiev Independent, in different parts of Kiev in their homes, were going through the same or similar realizations. So what did we do? 
We opened our laptops and we started writing. The news on our website and social media didn't stop that morning, and they haven't stopped since. We reported on every development. Tanks entering Ukraine from the north, Russian troops breaking in from the south, from Crimea, all of it. I have recently read through the history of our work chats for that morning, and I was astonished because there it was, a group of this young journalists sitting in the city under attack and talking about things like who is sharing which story on social media and who is going to update the newsletter that was already scheduled to be sent out that morning. We all became war reporters overnight and we accepted this new role. We could flee and be a newsroom in exile, reporting from the safety of Poland, for example. But we stayed in Ukraine. In the next few days, a part of our staff, including myself, left Kyiv for other cities. A few stayed in Kyiv. We were dispersed around the country, and that way, if Russians were to hit one city or even to occupy it, we knew that the Kyiv independent would survive. Soon, soon thanks, to, thanks to the incredible bravery and sacrifices of Ukraine's armed forces, we were able to all return to Kyiv. Since then, we went through numerous air attacks and through a very dark winter of constant blackouts as Russia threw all of its efforts at targeting Ukraine's energy grid. We made it work. We learned to live on two hours of electricity a day. We learned to hold our editorial meetings in candlelight. And we've drunk a lot of hot tea that winter. And we made it through. My colleagues have been going to the front line and to liberated territories all the time, risking their lives, risking their health and their mental health to tell the world the real stories from the ground in Ukraine. We don't have the same resources that many of our colleagues from international media have. We don't work in big crews that has security details and, and fixers and drivers. When the Kyiv independent goes to the front line, it's often just one journalist with a camera. There is never an assignment to go to the front line. Our journalists volunteer to do it. For most of them, it's their first experience of war reporting. They had to learn as they go. Unlike our foreign colleagues, we didn't have the luxury of coming to Ukraine for a reporting trip for a week or two and then going back home to safety. This is our home. We're all living the story as we are reporting it. The bravery and dedication of my journalist is something that keeps me going every day. And it all has yielded results. Our nonstop news coverage coming from Ukraine got us the attention of the world. In the first weeks of the invasion, our Twitter went from just 30,000 followers to over 2 million. We went from a little known media startup to one of the most successful and influential media outlets in the region. That was the third important choice we made. We chose to stay in Ukraine and to report on the war at our home. Looking back, I'm particularly proud of one decision we made on the first day of the full-scale war. That decision is our main headline of the day. That morning, of course, every publication around the world reported about Russia attacking Ukraine. But they did it in very different words. A lot of them did it in the words of Vladimir Putin, 
when Putin announced the invasion, he tried to present it as an operation, a special military operation to protect Russia from the possible aggression of Ukraine and by extent of the Western world. I regret to say that most Western publications reported it that morning using the words that the dictator offered them. The headlines on the main news sites across the world said, Putin announces special military operation against Ukraine. Now we talk a lot about the role that disinformation plays in Russia's war. That headline was Russia's disinformation first victory. Because what is a special military operation? Do we now allow anyone to just invent words? Do we allow and should we allow a bloody dictator to choose how we will define his actions? Or should we call it as it is? When a country sends troops into a neighbor neighboring state to invade and subjugate it and faces resistance, there is a word for that. It's a very old word and a very short one. And it's the one that Russia wanted to avoid so much. The headline on the Kiev Independence website that morning was very simple. It said, Putin declares war on Ukraine. Calling it a war, calling it a war was a bold choice even for us, because that morning no one else was doing it. I'm proud that we went for it and called it what it is. The battle against disinformation can sometimes seem hopeless, but I think that morning we won one round. Of course, soon everyone was calling it a war. But those headlines of that morning, they are still there on the internet, you can find them. And perhaps it's a good thing that they are there, because they are reminding us that we must not allow dictators, or anyone else for that matter, to choose our words for us. That lesson has not been learned yet. Last year, Russia pretended to hold so-called referendums in the occupied territories in Ukraine. It was asking locals, Ukrainians, to vote on whether they want to be part of Russia. And of course, Russia reported that locals overwhelmingly voted in favor of Russia. That whole thing was an attempt of the Kremlin to solidify its claim on the invaded territories, on the recently invaded territories, as Ukraine was conducting counteroffensives. And again, some Western media outlets reported about these referendums as if they were the real thing. From their headlines, you would never know that it's a sham, sham vote held at gunpoint. That was a huge win for Russian propaganda and for disinformation in general. Employees in one news agency told me of the record that the editors think that calling those sham referendums would mean, quote, to take the side of Ukraine and therefore to disrupt the balance in the reporting. As journalists, we are taught to maintain balance, to have both sides of the story. But if watching the global reporting about the war in Ukraine taught me one thing, it's that thoughtlessly following that role is irresponsible and even dangerous. What it does, it leads to you as a reporter presenting to your readers two sides of the story, where one side comes from something that you've seen, you've witnessed with your own eyes in Ukraine, and the other side is what the Russian government tells you that you witnessed. So it's facts equalized with propaganda. It's a fake balance. And if you're presenting it to your readers as two sides of the story, you're failing them. A war can't be reported on as a sports game. 
It's not Russia does this, Ukraine responds with that, let's see who wins. It's a tragic and a very black and white attack on the current world order. It's not just Ukraine that is under attack. Everything that your readers hold dear, their freedoms and liberties, democracy, the connected world, a peaceful life, all of it is under attack in this very second. Because yes, it's the cities of Ukraine that are hit with bombs, but it's the values of the free world that are their real target. And it's not a sports game. It's a survival battle. This is why we at the Kiev Independent have been taking a stance in these matters. We have dedicated our editorials to the matter of disinformation and the way Ukraine's war is reported on globally. We have called out the Western reporting on the referendums in Ukraine. And we stood up to the New York Times, who wrote in their own editorial last year that Ukraine must make concessions and surrender some of its territories to Russia to stop the war. That editorial was published in May last year, just over a month after the town of Bucha near Kyiv was liberated. And we've seen for the first time what Russians do to Ukrainians in the occupied territories. By suggesting to give up land to Russia, the New York Times editorial was effectively suggesting that we sentence our people to torture and death. We stood up to that and replied with our own editorial, setting the record straight. It won us a lot of praise and it felt good to be able to do it. And that was another choice that made us who we are. We chose to take a stance, we chose to always call things what they are and demand that others do it. To not just report about what's happening in Ukraine, but to use our voice to educate the world about Ukraine, about Russia, and to talk about things like disinformation and the mistakes in global reporting of the war. The other choice, one of the most important ones and painful ones, came in the middle of last year. And it really put our principles to test. Last summer, one of our reporters came to me and said that she has sources telling her about misconduct and abuse in one unit of the Ukrainian military and that she wants to turn it into an investigative story. At that time, there were no reports in Ukrainian media criticizing the government or let alone criticizing the military. We were all in a survival mode as a nation and it felt like all of us being in one boat. Running the story meant to disrupt that state. Besides that, we had to consider who our audience was. We published in English. Our readers are abroad. Among them are many decision makers. Publishing an expose about anyone in the Ukrainian military could tarnish the heroic image of Ukraine and even cost us some of the Western support that we need to win the war. Were we ready to risk that? We also knew that by running the story, we could be feeding Russian propaganda with material to use against Ukraine. And we knew we could face consequences from our own government. We could be publicly branded traitors. We could face a criminal case. After all, Ukraine lives under martial law and our story could be seen as hurting national security. And the cherry on top? Reporters during the story would be in a physical threat. At the center of the story was the former Polish gangster wanted in Poland, who somehow became one of the commanders of the International Legion. That's the unit in the Ukrainian military that the story was centered around. 
that's a special unit for foreigners who volunteered to fight uh, to defend Ukraine. That wasn't an easy choice to make. We ran the story. The story came out on August 17th. It was titled Suicide Missions, Abuse, Physical Threats, International Legion Fighters Speak Out Against Leadership's Misconduct. Three months later, we published the second part with even more serious allegations. This time, our sources told us that weapons were going missing. We chose to do it because we deeply believed it was the right thing to do. We are patriots of our country, and we think that shedding light on any misconduct anywhere, especially in the military while there is war, is not hurting Ukraine, but it's helping it. I know that we were judged for this choice, even by some of our colleagues in other Ukrainian media. I understand them. I know that many Ukrainian journalists are struggling with self-censorship, thinking that they don't have the right to write stories criticizing the government because that would harm Ukraine and that all those stories need to be on hold until the war is won. I know that our government, being a government, would love to, for all of us to think that. But I think that if we skipped that story, if we shoved it under the rug, we would have betrayed our readers, betrayed ourselves, betrayed our profession, and actually betrayed the values that my fellow Ukrainians are fighting and dying for. After all, in this war, Ukraine is fighting for its future. It is fighting for the right to live by the values of the free world. Freedom of speech is one of these values. And when so many Ukrainians are dying to defend it, we would be ashamed of ourselves if we weren't exercising it. Publishing this story, this investigation, was a test of our editorial independence and devotion to the public's interest. We believed that we passed it with dignity. That choice was one of the most important ones we've made. Finally, there is one last choice that is defining who we are. And we are making it every day. It's the choice to carry on. The story of the Kiev Independent hasn't been one big success. It's a bumpy road, and it's an everyday battle. After, <clears throat> after a year and a half of reporting about the war, of living through it, of working without vacations and almost without any days off, we're all exhausted, physically and mentally. It's one thing to fight back the first attack, to fight the first battle. But it's a different thing to keep fi fighting battles every day. It would be very easy to just stop. But we are not stopping. When the number of our supporters, our patrons, started going down last year in summer, it looked like it was over. This initial wave of support is gone and it will be just decreasing from now on. But we refused to accept that. We rolled our sleeves and got to work to grow our membership base again. We planned campaigns, we came up with creative ideas, we got everyone in the newsroom involved in it. And in a couple of months, we broke the trend. And our membership base started growing again and reached 10,000 people by the end of the year. That was a big win for us. One Twitter, which we relied on as one of our key platforms, started downplaying Ukraine content. We responded by focusing on other platforms and launching more newsletters to 
talk to our followers directly. And when the war fatigue started setting in, we looked for new ways to tell stories to our readers. We launched a weekly video podcast and an amazing video series about disinformation and Ukrainian history. And I know that there are so many challenges like that ahead of us, but I know that we can take them. We learned in this last year, we learned in this last year and a half that we as journalists and as people, we don't have to be shaped by external circumstances. We always have a choice. We can choose to fight back. We can choose to defend our beliefs and we can succeed. It is proved by the example of the Kiev Independent. And more importantly, it is being proved every day by the example of Ukraine. Thank you.